at the minute in this lesson, the, the children are involved in assessing their own learning this week and then setting their targets for the next week. So this is something that we, we do a lot in school in, in, in many different ways. Um, for example, if you, if you point your camera up there, you'll, you'll see the, the targets on the ceiling, which are the, the targets that the children have set and then have achieved. The middle section of that is, is a mini learning review, which we try to do occasionally to, to really try and get children to think about how they learn and how they learn best and what, what styles of learning suit them. The stars came from three stars and a wish, which is three things that you would like them to do or you're wanting them to achieve in each lesson and then a wish the, um, what you'd like them to take forward to the next lesson. When they've achieved their wish three times, we stick them on the ceiling above where they sit and we call them wishes because, to be honest, when we call them a target, they weren't that interested, but when you call them a wish and they've taken ownership of this wish, something they want to do, they've really taken it on board. Personalised learning means that as a teacher you stop thinking so much about what you are teaching and thinking about what the children are learning and how they are learning and getting them really involved in their own learning. It's about engaging the children in their own learning, making sure that they really feel a part of what they're doing, that the activities they're doing in class are meaningful to them and their lives and that they have kind of bought into their own sort of learning journey. Some children really like working at computers. Some children prefer to do things practically with real equipment. If they're enjoying and they're achieving, then I'm perfectly happy with whichever way they've chosen to learn, and I try and give them the opportunities to do that. What you've got to do is not think, what do I want to teach, but what do I want them to learn, and how might they ask me to do that? So it's making sure you've got sort of lots of different ways of doing things up your sleeves, so that you can take on board their ideas and develop them and so they've got ownership of the lesson but yet you've got ownership of what you're trying to achieve at the end of it. So that's some of the theory. How does it translate into a practical lesson? Assistant Head John Crowley is teaching a maths lesson about angles. Now then, you should have a triangle. Most of yours are purple but mine is green. And what you need to do is you need to remove the angles. So I want you to tear off one, two, three angles. And then I want you to put your angles together so that you've got one, two, three angles. And I want to see if you notice anything. What do we notice along the bottom? where my three angles are, because there's my three angles that you've torn off. And what do we notice that we have? 180 degrees. 180 degrees. Now can you tell, Paul, that they're on 180 degrees? You're right, Paul. Because it's on a straight line. Because it's on a straight line. What I'm trying to do is to allow the children to explore in, in different ways. So I've shown them visually, they've made practically, and now they're testing out by drawing. Um, to try and uh, get this concept very concrete that um, the three angles in a triangle make 180 degrees. So at this stage of the lesson, we're just trying to teach that one concept, but by using different approaches, hopefully that will sink in better. The table over there, I've just thrown a little bit of extra challenging to emphasise Kyle's point that we could try triangles with an obtuse angle, because they were the ones who did particularly well yesterday when we were drawing and measuring angles and we're coming up with the, the rules. So those I'm pushing a little bit further, which I was just coming to Kyle to, to sort of see how he got with that as well. Well, that's 80 and that's nearly 90. That looks about right. That's a bit less and that's the smallest. So they look about right. Should we just check? We're moving on to assessing the outcomes of the last sort of couple of days in class. The few people that felt they wanted a little bit more practice at measuring angles first so we've got a, an IT programme which guides them through the process of measuring angles. And I've got one group who I'm wanting to um, really crack on with this because I think they've got the concepts that I'm after this week and we can move on to furthering the learning and getting on to the investigation phase of the lesson. So you're right, the corner will be 90 degrees, but we don't want the whole corner, do we? Every class is different. This year's year six as a cohort is 
a very different year group to last year's year six. They come with different problems, they come with different talents, they come with different abilities. And you have to adapt the way that you work to suit that. And then you also have to take into account that within that kind of feel for the class, the individuals have their own personal styles as well. So if you have a class where predominantly they're a very chatty class and they like to talk and they like to discuss, there will still be children in that class who are very quiet and very reticent to come forward with their own thoughts and opinions. What we do in Year 6 is we have lots of different groups which are put together for different reasons. So we'll have some groups who are grouped for learning style preferences. We'll have some groups that are grouped for academic abilities in particular areas. We'll have some groups that are grouped because they get on better together. And we keep that flexibility to try and make sure that everybody achieves as best they can. So we know that that angle there is 60, yeah? And we know that that is 12, and we know it's all fitting inside an angle that is how many degrees? 90. All right, so if I draw that here... Oh, okay, now, is it um, 18? It might well be. Some children really enjoy working in a group, and some children really enjoy working on their own. And so at some times you would want all children to work in a group because that's a skill to learn. And at some times you'd want all children to work on their own. But also, for uh, as much as possible, you want them to enjoy their learning and therefore they can learn in the way that they enjoy best. So you now think it might well make 360 degrees. What would you need to do to test it out? Draw. Draw one hand. Use a protractor hand. Add them up. You're always trying to match every every uh, interaction with the child with the, the level that they are at and the, the difficulties they're having to scaffold them to take them onto the next step in their learning. And you can never get that absolutely right. Um, but I think the, the, the important thing is to make sure you don't assume because the, the notion of one group being more able or less able isn't right. They will be more able at certain things in certain aspects, but they will also have problems with those certain things in certain aspects, as will every individual. So I think the, the key is assessment for learning, that for every learning objective, you are saying, right, which children have met that objective, which children need to work on that objective, which children can go beyond that objective, and try and get that as accurate as you possibly can. So that assessment for learning is, is vital, and, and it's kind of moving away a little bit from saying they are my top group and they will somehow stay my top group no matter what, and saying, right, for this piece of learning, who needs to do this step and to group those together and to take them. Year 6 teacher Charlotte Smith also sees grouping as vital in delivering personalised learning. She thought hard about group composition for a project stemming from a visit to the Leeds United football ground. Is there anything we need to remember, especially when we're doing a talking guidebook compared to a written one or a picture one? Roscoe? Describe it. Yeah, you've got to put a lot more description in, don't you? Why do you need lots more description, Oliver? So then they understand what you're talking about in more detail. Yeah, that's right, so they can understand what you're talking about in detail. You Josh. Emotion in it. We need to get emotion in. Are you listening, that group? You've got to get your emotion in. Emphasise your words. We don't want to have robot voices. Yeah, make it nice and interesting. We went to Ellen Road on a school trip um, with a literacy focus. So they collected words and they wandered around the stadium. And I've taken that on board and decided to make a virtual or a tour guide for the stadium. But because we have obviously children who like to learn in different ways, I thought three different ways they can access that guide by doing it either making an audio guide for somebody. And some of the children who are working on that aren't very good speakers and are quite shy, so their targets that they've written themselves are to be a bit braver and have a go and speak on the tape. And other children who don't listen very well are in that group as well to help them you know, develop their listening skills. I'm doing the vocal bit of this exercise because it's like part of drama sort of work and it's one of my strong points is drama, so it helps me. And if you misbehave, you will be sent to the detention room where you will go and get locked up against one of the bars for the whole night. The computer group, there's a mixture of children who are capable of doing a virtual tour and others who, again, they're working towards that as a target. We're doing all, some pictures of the stadium and statues and stuff in the stadium. 
and then like writing bits about it. This is a strength because we're good on computers and stuff. And the written group, they've all chosen to write. So it's giving children ways of accessing the same objective but in a different way. On the outside of the scene, there's a statue of Billy Bremer. It was made out of bronze and has been there for many years. If you was visit Ellen Road, you may notice that his feet are a lot bigger than they're supposed to be to balance the weight or it will fall down. The fans leave shirts, scarves and flowers on many occasions to remember when Leeds United won in the 60s, 70s and 80s. I think it's going really well. They're, they're focused, they're, they're all on task. The written group have taken it in two different directions already. One's planning a very detailed spider's diagram. Another one wants something we haven't gotten. So for the next lesson, I'll make sure they've got that map shrunk so they can put it into their work. Um, it's taking on board what they're asking for, but keeping it within the remit of the lesson, you know, keep, keeping it within the boundaries, but letting them explore right to the edge of them if they want to. I suppose we started personalised learning at the point at which we actually wrote down a school, a strategic plan for it. Um, and it surprised me on the one hand that we needed to do that and then I thought but of course we do. We need to draw together what we're doing that meets um, the criteria of personalised learning and we need to look at where the gaps are and what, how we could reconfigure the school day, the school week, the school term to do things a little better. So I would like you to spend one minute that's all, talking to the person next to you about their start. How, are they achieving it yet? Are they doing well? Can you be positive and critical? Can you say one good thing and one thing that will help them? It's our target that we've got to do whilst we're doing this for the past few lessons. So when I'm writing, I've got to order information into like groups of paragraphs. And once we've achieved it, we'll get a new target to do. Here we are in 2007, and I would say we started this journey probably officially in 2003. Um, now I look back and see that what we've been doing hasn't cost us a great deal in terms of pounds and pence, but it has been a philosophy that's woven its way into the way that we do things. And in some ways that's much harder than, say, buying in a scheme of work and giving it out. With this project, they're going to do it in two ways. So they're either it's a strength or a weakness for them, the group they're in now, and then we'll do it again. The same project, they'll make another guide in a different way, which will be their strength or their weakness. So they're all going to play to their strengths and develop on their weaknesses at the moment and help each other because of that. So it's, it's me knowing the children really quite well to know which group would be the best for them. If personalised learning is really going to work, you have to model it as adults. And so I need to also develop a personalised learning culture for my staff team so that they develop as individuals, that they grow, that their confidence is realised and that their talents are nurtured. And when that happens, it's very catching. And if you're modelling that as a school leader, then the teachers will model that with the children and so on. And it becomes like a sort of domino effect.